ever been a time in your life when you needed God to show up, but you doubted that he would, but God showed up anyway, and you said, God, forgive me. <sighs> we can all say yes. Well, welcome to Sunday School Made Simple. This is the fastest growing online community of Christian education, teachers and students of the word. Hi, I'm Dr. Laverne Tolbert, and I'm so excited as we continue to explore the word of God using the precepts for living commentary. Now remember, each week we remind you to ring the bell at the bottom of this video to subscribe to our show so that you don't miss out on any new lessons. And as a teacher, don't you want to be equipped so that your students don't merely download information, but actually receive revelation for transformation? Subscribe to PresetsForLivingOnline.com and get complete lesson plans and additional invaluable resources. And when you subscribe, you'll have access to Sunday School Made Simple on your tablet, phone, or laptop. So go to PresetsForLivingOnline.com and get your resources today. Well, we're continuing this quarter which is entitled, Responding to God's Grace. And we have biblical examples of how people respond to God's preservation, forgiveness, healing, salvation, blessings, grace, oh my goodness, God's unmerited favor to undeserving mankind. <laughs> and this quarter is really a time when we see that God is present in times of difficulty. And we learn how we should respond to God's presence. Each week, we make Sunday School simple with an easy to understand format. The text for you students of the word, and then teaching tips for those of you who teach. Well, today's lesson title is God Forgives, which tells the account of Moses interceding for Israel in the wilderness and God forgiving them. So, before we begin, let's pray. Father, thank you for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's explore the text by reading our lesson aim. By the end of the lesson, we will comprehend the significance of Moses' intercession for the people of Israel. Repent for rebelling against God's plans and not trusting God's strength and ask for forgiveness for our sins. Let's read our first set of verses from our scripture lesson in number 14, and I'm going to read verses 10 and 11 and 12 in the New Living Translation. Numbers chapter 14 verse 10 says, but the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me? Even after all the miraculous signs I've done among them, I will disown them and destroy them with a plague. Then I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they are. Well, you know, we talk about what's important to know, feel, and do. So let's talk about what's important to know from these verses that we just read. There are two, two key points to know from Numbers 14, verses 10 and 11. The first is Israel disregards God's promises and they reject the report of Joshua and Caleb. The second point is, the Lord threatens to destroy Israel and reject them as his people. Did you hear the D's and the R's in that? I hope you got it, okay. So, last week, remember the lesson? The 12 spies of Israel all, re all report that the promised land of Canaan was fruitful and abundant. They recognize that it's a wonderful place, just as God has promised. But then 10 of the spies see the land through their fear, while Joshua and Caleb see the land through faith. 
The 10 spies see giants in the land and perceive that there's obstacles or that are too big to overcome. But Joshua and Caleb remember God is faithful and they believe that no matter what the obstacle, the Lord is greater. Unfortunately, as a result of the poor, negative, fearful report, the people not only complained that God had set them up for failure and destruction, but now they're threatening to kill the men who have faith in the Lord. So in verse 10, which we just read, the Lord hears their disbelief and desire for violence, and the glory of the Lord shows up at the tabernacle. When we see this term, glory of the Lord, we realize that this is a special manifestation of God's presence. God literally shows up, which means his heaviness or his weightiness is evident. And it gives us a picture of God's splendor and majesty. Well, God's glory descends and stops the people from further sin by attacking their leaders. But now God is ready to do some destroying of his own. <laughs> He threatens to destroy Israel and start all over again with just Moses and his family. God says he'll send a plague and it's going to be his divine judgment, which brings utter destruction. And he says his covenant promise with Abraham and Israel. He doesn't say this, but if God destroys the people, that means that his covenant promise with Abraham and Israel, it's going to be replaced by what God wants to do next, a greater nation through his servant Moses. God asked Moses, how long will this continue? Now, it's not as if he doesn't know the answer. This is a rhetorical question, which means that it doesn't have to be answered. But the question highlights the length God has gone through to deliver and provide for his people. The children of Israel had seen everything, miracles in Egypt, the power of God against their Egyptian oppressors, miracles, provisions, multiple times, and God's power and wisdom at Mount Sinai. Now they faced one last obstacle and still they do not believe God or what he can do to keep his promises. God's threat to destroy them is an indication of the seriousness of their rebellion. Well, let's continue reading. We're now at Numbers chapter 14, verses 13, all the way through to verse 19. But Moses objected. What will the Egyptians think? I just lost my place. Here we are. What will the Egyptians think when they hear about it? He asked the Lord. They know full well the power you displayed in rescuing your people from Egypt. Now if you destroy them, the Egyptians will send a report to the inhabitants of this land who have already heard that you live among your people. They know, Lord, that you've appeared to your people face to face and that your pillar of cloud hovers over them. They know that you go before them in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Now, if you slaughtered all these people with a single blow, the nations will have heard your fame. The nations that have heard your fame will say, the Lord was not able to bring them into the land he swore to give them. So he killed them in the wilderness. Please, Lord, prove that your power is as great as you have declared, as you have claimed. For you said, the Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, loving every kind of sin and rebellion, forgiving every kind of sin. Excuse me. Let me read that again. Verse 18. The Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. 
but he does not excuse the guilty. He lays the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children to the third and fourth generations. In keeping with your magnificent, unfailing love, please pardon the sins of this people, just as you have, just as you have forgiven them ever since they left Egypt. Well, that was a mouthful, wasn't it? <laughs> That's some prayer. Oh my goodness. You know, as I was reading that, I was almost praying for us. Oh my goodness. Well, there are two key points from these verses, and they are, Moses intercedes for Israel. Moses appeals to the Lord's history with Israel and his word. So what does that mean? Moses prays to the Lord on behalf of Israel. First, he appeals to God's reputation. He asks that the Lord not destroy Israel because the nations, including Egypt, will hear the report of their destruction and believe that God delivered them from bondage for no reason. Moses knew God's faithful to keep his promise to bring them into the promised land. So he asked God to demonstrate his faithfulness by doing so. He says he appeals to God's nature and God's word. He repeats what God has said about who he is. He says, God, you are slow to anger. You're filled with unfailing love and you are a forgiving God. God had spoken that word to Israel on Mount Sinai and shown his power to deliver and forgive Israel before. So Moses pleads with God, forgive them again, not because they deserve it, but because you are merciful, God. Well, our last passage of the scripture for today's lesson comes from Numbers 14 through 20, or Numbers, I'm sorry, Numbers verse 20. Numbers chapter 14, verse 20. There it is. Then the Lord said, I will pardon them as you have requested. Wow. There's only one key point from this final verse in our lesson. The Lord responds to Moses' prayer with forgiveness. Isn't that something? Moses took the initiative to stand in the gap through prayer for Israel. And God responds by doing what he asks. He forgives their sin. You know, God could have easily destroyed them, but he decided to spare them one more time. It's important to remember that it was not just the words of Moses' prayer that moved God to forgiveness. Mm -mm. There isn't anything particularly unique about Moses in this instance, besides his relationship with the Lord, but that Moses was willing to seek God on behalf of the people that mattered to God. So he chose to honor Moses' request and pardon the sins of Israel. God is faithful to do what he promised. He had already said he was going to bring Israel into the promised land and he would keep that promise. He would spare Israel because of his mercy. Mercy. Remember that? We talked about that a couple of lessons ago. It has the, the idea of a prior relationship between God and humankind. God forgives and allows them to live instead of destroying them for their faithless response and their rebellious intentions to kill their leaders. Now, this doesn't mean that God is canceling his judgment because a guilty person isn't suddenly innocent. That's not what the scripture is saying. That's what, not God's intent. He delays his judgment. He redistributes it to the third and the fourth generations. Well, that's what's important to know. Now, what's important to feel? We should feel humbled by the mercy of God. As we go through life, we each have many different experiences of doubt and fear, other distractions. Oh my goodness, there are so many. And sometimes, you know, 
we don't maintain our faith in God. We look at the situation, the circumstances. Circumstances are things that stand around. And when we look at the things that stand around those circumstances, we take our eyes off God. Prayerfully, these tough times that we go through don't cause us to be angry with God or result in us losing our faith. Mm -mm. When we review our past, and this is what we do in a tough time, we should remember that God is faithful. And we should rejoice that God forgives us even when we doubt or fall short of his call. But don't give in to fear. Let's be humbled. In Christ, we are reminded that nothing can separate us from God's love and that God is still patient, forgiving. He continues to transform our lives for our good and his glory. That should encourage someone out there today. So what should we do in response to today's lesson? How about this? Let's intercede. We should pray for God's forgiveness for others. We should stand in the gap for God's people just like Moses did. Intercession tugs at the heart of God. It, it's because we're asking him to be true to his character and act on behalf of the person for whom we are praying. Do they need forgiveness? We should pray. Do they need healing? Pray. Do they need a miracle? Pray, pray, pray. It's so good to know that God is gracious and merciful. He's listening. He's ready to answer prayer. Well, that's our lesson. We're ready now for the Word Made Simple. And in this week's lesson, the Word Made Simple is forgive. <laughs> in Numbers chapter 14, verse 20 of the New Living Translation, it's translated as pardon. God pardons the sin of Israel. It's very important to note this, that the Forgiveness spoken about here is only used in relationship to God. Isn't that profound? The Hebrew word is salak. Salak, I'm going to try to say it with a little. <laughs> and only God can salak, sin. When a person sins against another person or directly against God, only God can forgive the sin. The word here is fascinating because it's translated pardon, sometimes to distinguish it from forgiveness offered through Christ when God selects sin. He chooses not to punish Israel for their sin, but their sinfulness, the uncleanness, the after effect of the sin still remains. Only the blood sacrifice under the Old Testament could cleanse the stain of sin. And the blood of Jesus Christ is given as the ultimate cleansing and true, full forgiveness of sin. God not only selects our sin through Christ, he removes it from us as far as the east is from the west. And he makes us right with him again. Isn't that a beautiful word? It's, a sim it's made simple for you, but it's profound, isn't it? <laughs> Well, now let's move on to our teaching tips since we've gone through our text for today. First of all, don't forget to begin each lesson with prayer. Pray that your students will have receptive hearts and minds to be obedient to God's word. And then pray that you will be creative. And as I've been saying these few lessons, creativity begins at the beginning of the week. It, you can't ask the Lord to make you creative on a Saturday night and you're teaching Sunday school Sunday morning. Give the Holy Spirit time to work with you. And then, and then pray that your students will apply what they've learned to their lives. We love teaching, don't we? Praise the Lord. Well, let's look at our hook. How would you open the lesson? Well, here's a question that's not in here, but one that I thought of. Was there ever a time when God was angry with you? If you ask students that question, I bet you'll have an interesting conversation. Or, of course, you can download the In Focus story, the video from PreceptsForLivingOnline.com and answer the question at the end, which is, how difficult do you find it to forgive others whom you love, but they've wronged you? 
That's another good discussion question. And then once you've talked about that for about maybe 10 minutes, seven to 10 minutes or so, you're ready to get into your book. The book stands for the book, the Bible, where you present the scriptures. So invite volunteers to read the entire portion of scriptures. You can have them read in unison and have one read at a time or whatever works for your class. And then ask, what stood out to you or resonated with you from these verses? And now go to the in-depth paragraphs which explain the verses that your students just read. At this point, you can divide the class into groups, have them answer the two questions and search the scriptures, or you can do search the scriptures as a large class altogether without dividing in groups. Depends upon you. Now you transition to look or explore the meaning, which is what's going on in our world today? What does this mean to us today? And in discuss the meaning, this is a good time for another lively conversation. One of the questions in Discuss the Meaning is, what impact have you seen in the lives of the people you've prayed for? Good question. Bring it right home to what we're doing today. And so then you're ready for took or next step for application. So invite a volunteer to read Liberating Lesson, and that's powerful. Also read Application for Activation, another powerful paragraph. Let me give you a clue. This activation, application or activation, invites students to do something during the week, and you know what it is? Confess their sins and intercede for family and friends. What a great way to put to place, to put into action what we've learned in our lesson. Now to close your class, why not invite one student to stand in the gap for your class, like Moses, and to intercede for the class and pray for the class and close in prayer that way. Good lesson, huh? All right, now let's talk mailbag. Again is Minister Alan Reynolds, scholar, editor, writer, digital genius, and all of that, youth teacher, genius. lover of the Lord. Yes, that's true. <laughs> okay, well, you know, and, and a humble, humble man of God. So, question. Yes. What prompts you to intercede? That is something that is really actually close to my heart. And I say the, probably the first thing that prompted me to intercede were my mom. Mm. Um, she was an intercessor from the time that I got sick when I was young. Mm. And she started doing that not just as a practice for me, but ended up joining prayer groups and intercession groups at church and other ministries and something that really inspired her. And so seeing her do it taught me that whatever is going on, always be prayerful. Right, Paul instructs us to, to be prayerful about everything, right, to be anxious for nothing, to be prayerful about everything, but to make our requests known to God. And then the peace of God guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so whether it's sickness in a family, whether it's uh, somebody in need of help, um, whatever requests come to me, I'm even one of those people where I'm reading through Facebook, scrolling, and when people say, hey, you know, such and such is going on, pray for me, I take the opportunity right then to pray. Uh, because if I say, yeah, I'm going to pray for you, a lot of times we say, that, I'll pray for you, you know, I'll pray for you, brother, sister, and then we just go on about our days, but I make a point to do it right then. And so really inspired by my mom, but anything can prompt me to intercede. What, what kind of prompts you? Oh my, as you were saying that, I was thinking how your mom really modeled to you, to, you know, and that's mothers and fathers. We have such an opportunity to model to children what it means to be godly. Mm -hmm. And she modeled that to you and, and gave you a specific tool yeah. of the intercession. So what prompts me, I belong to a, a prayer group, a weekly group, mm -hmm. and we get together on Wednesday mornings and we pray. We pray from 10 to about 1. Mm. Part of that time is used for kind of a sharing about what's going on in our lives. Um, and so we, we used to share what's going on in our lives and then pray, but mm -hmm. now we get together and we pray first. Mm. And it's um, Dr. Gail Riley who re leads this prayer group. We pray first, and then we talk about what's going on in our lives. Mm -hmm. We pray for the nation, we pray for the president, we mm -hmm. pray for what the Bible tells us to pray. We pray for people from different churches. Mm -hmm. So we pray for each of the pastors in the churches. We mm -hmm. intercede for people who are sick. I mean, we 
pray. Mm. So, and it's amazing. I have to tell you this. From uh, the time that we spent in intercession and praying, what what we've seen is God show up in our lives. We don't spend a lot of time praying about our personal needs. We do if, you know, something is going on that needs prayer. But, oh, my goodness, we've seen God show up for us mm. in big ways, miraculous ways. Mm. So That's it. I, right? I, I mean, that making it a weekly practice, I mean, even with others, that's so huge. Yes. Uh, because we aren't called to do this alone. Jesus is making intercession for us always. But he calls us as his church to be his body and intercede. We're called to be kings and priests. And that second part, being priests, means that we stand in the gap between God and people. And, and you're modeling that. That's wonderful. Godly man here. Jesus is praying for you. He's interceding. The Holy Spirit, Romans 8, he's interceding yes. for you. Oh, my goodness. You got it made. Christian, believer, you got it made. <laughs> let's close this out. I think we could talk about this for quite a while. Yes, indeed. So let's close this out with our... Uh, keep in mind verse, and Alan's going to read that for us this week. And so this is from Numbers chapter 14, verse 19. Again, New Living Translation. It says, In keeping with your magnificent, unfailing love, please pardon the sins of this people, just as you have forgiven them ever since the day they left Egypt. Well, let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for our people, our families. Let's pray. We need God to forgive us, to heal us, to cleanse us, to restore us. Amen. Have a good week of prayer. God bless.